Welcome into the February 23rd edition of the Lockdown Lease Podcast. I'm Mike DeStefano with Dave Morissuti. We got some clarity on the Jake Muzzin situation, so we'll update you guys on that and what it means for him and the Toronto Maple Leafs. And there was a roster move today, which could signal another move is near, Dave. I'll explain what I mean momentarily. All that more coming up on today's edition of the Lockdown Lease Podcast, part of Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's a one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. The Locked On Leafs podcast is a daily Maple Leaf Central podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcast from, you can also check us out on video form on YouTube. Hit subscribe, hit the little notification bell as well. We put new videos out each and every day through the week, Monday through Friday. Uh, it's all Leafs all the time. And if you're a big time Leafs supporter, you got to be locked into Locked On Leafs. Um, so we got some uh, some stuff that we got to get to today. It was an off day in Leafs Nation, so not a whole lot to. Uh, to report on the ice, but plenty of off ice news that we got to talk about. Jake Muzzin, um, some clarity there for what's going on with him. There was uh, a player that was sent on waivers, which I think maybe is signaling uh, something else to us. Then a couple other trades in the NHL, including uh, a future Hall of Famer, let's say technically getting dealt. So we'll we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll tell you about those moves as well. But let's start with Jake Muzzin. Um, do you want to you pull up the statement that we got from the Maple Leafs today? Um, so this afternoon, uh, the Toronto, uh, this is a statement that they put out to the fan base and sent out to the media. The Toronto Maple Leafs announced today that after follow-up consultation this month with various specialists, our medical staff have determined that defenseman Jake Muzzin has been ruled out for the rest of the 2020-22 uh, 23 regular season and playoffs as he recovers from a cervical spine injury. The club will provide a further update as to his status at training camp in September of 2023. Muzzin skated in four games. The Leafs this season record just one assist. So um, Jake Muzzin officially done for the year will not be a Kucherov situation either. They went ahead and made sure that was well known. He's done for the regular season and playoffs. And potentially he could come back at some point. They'll see what's going on with his health in uh, in 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 the fall when they return for camp in September. But uh, it's news that we were expecting, uh, but still kind of sucks nonetheless. Yeah, it's brutal because Jake Muzzin, you you said it, only skated in four games this season. You would hope that. You know, he was going to be able to come back. He had a good end to the last season, the playoffs. He'd be able to come back, be somewhat of a factor for the Leafs in the playoffs, maybe, potentially, who knows. But I mean, it seemed unlikely at this point, considering, you know, all the doubt about his status and all those things. So it's just really unfortunate for him because I, I have a lot of respect for the game that Jake Muzzin plays, the role he plays on this team. And no one should ever have to go and deal with this. No, and, and he's still around the team. Like, you know, he was with the team. It was his birthday yesterday. So happy belated birthday, or on Tuesday, rather. So he got to watch uh, his his teammates go lay a butt whooping on the Buffalo Sabres. Um, but, like, it's his birthday, and, and the man was with his on-ice family, right, his second family, because he, he still cares a lot about this team and about the guys – um, in the lineup in that locker room. So he's still around the team. Um, and I think that's really key that he can be like a, a leader for the guys in the room. Um, if he's willing to, to stick around and still be part of the team, like I said, it's, it's unfortunate, um, injuries take a toll on, on some people. And when you're talking about a spinal injury, you, you don't take any, um, like you take every precaution possible and, um, you know, 
the rest of his life is certainly more important than the game of hockey and, and, you know, helping the Leafs get to the playoffs. So clearly everybody understands the position that, uh, that Jake Muzzin is in and, and, and is, you know, empathetic to the fact that he won't be able to, to play hockey, something that he loves, but at least he is, you know, still somewhat around the team and, and not completely away from the game. Um, despite not being able to actually, suit up and play games, which is something he's done his entire career and did really effectively. Yeah, no, exactly. And now it kind of also makes it, it kind of confirms now he's not becoming he or he's done for the season. You have to now think about, do you go out and try to replace him? And I know there's been some misconceptions about his, what his, what this means in terms of the Leafs cap and what they can and can't do now. Yeah, so if we if we move on, I suppose, to what this means for the Maple Leafs, um, I have seen it float around on Twitter that, that a lot of people are now saying, okay, now that the Leafs know that his cap isn't needed, they can put him on LTIR, and all of a sudden now they have so much space. Not quite. He's always been on LTIR, and they've been using that cap space um, throughout the season, and a majority of that cap space that was maybe available somewhat with him on LTIR was used by bringing in Ryan O'Reilly and Nola Chari also. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you want to bring up the, uh, the, the cap friendly page here that we got. So I don't know. Can we see the whole thing there? So like what's remaining left in the, so they got what 4.4 million remaining. So that's what they have in cap space. And that's not that's with Matt Murray on LTIR currently as well. The that's, assumption, sorry, yeah, that, that's why this remaining number is very important here. Yeah, so they have four point four million, and that's with both Matt Murray and uh, Jake Muzzin on LTIR. Uh, if you want to scroll down, it'll show you who's on LTIR, and and it kind of will tell you exactly what's going on with the team. So as you can see right here, both on long-term injured reserve, you got Jake Muzzin and Matt Murray's money, also Nick Robertson and Victor Mete. Um, So that's kind of how the Maple Leafs do have that $4 million. They're not getting an extra money because Jake Muzzin's out. That's already kind of been allotted for. And the $4 million that's there, the $4.4 million, unless Matt Murray is done for the year, which it doesn't sound like he is, um, you can't really go out and spend that money either. So the Jake Mur- Muzzin money, it, it's 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 not really there. Like it, it's been on LTIR the whole time, and the Maple Leafs have kind of already used that to. Because remember, early in the season when we were going through, they had to make trades in order to get the roster under the cap, or they had to have, play with a twenty man roster. Well, that's kind of where that money ended up going, right? There was an injury early on, and then Matt Murray gets hurt, and then Jake Muzzin ends up getting injured, and all of a sudden they've been in LTIR, and they've had enough space um, to be able to roster a full 23-man unit, um, but they don't have they don't pick up the additional 5.6 million. So I think there's a little bit of a misconception that with Muzzin out, now there's all of a sudden all this money that the Maple Leafs can go and spend it's pretty much has already been spent. And if you look at it, Matt Murray still has to come off. He's got 4.6 million. Now you're going to send Joseph wall down to the minors. And that's how you do end up with Matt Murray getting elevated. And he, yes, it's more than 4.4, but you're also sending Joseph wall down to the minors. I've done the math and they'll have about 500 K and in, in space at that point. Uh, But that's certainly not even enough to roster any type of NHL contract. So unless there are further moves to be made, um, putting Jake Muzzin, like this injury news for Jake Muzzin, doesn't give the Maple Leafs any more cap space uh, to make an additional move that they weren't already thinking of making or uh, that already hasn't been made. Yeah, and two additions to that. One, even if the Leafs wanted like the Leafs are at the maximum roster size of 23 right now. So yes. when Matt Murray comes back, yeah, they'll have to send Joseph Wall down. And if they make any trades, they got to send someone down to the minors or trade an NHL, like a, a body off the NHL roster. So they're at the max with that. And the other thing on top of that, somebody was saying, well, then maybe why don't you trade Jake Muzzin? 
well, you can't because you're using his cap space. The only time you can really trade Jake Muzzin is in the offseason. That, yeah. That's the only time you can consider that. But right now, the Leafs are getting value by putting Jake Muzzin on LTIR right now. So that's that's basically the situation they find themselves in. Yeah, so I, I, I just I saw a lot of comments in our last video, and I've seen a lot of people online, Twitter, saying, okay, now that Muzzin's gone, now the Leafs have a lot more money to spend. That's not necessarily the case. Unless, of course, Matt Murray, in the next couple of weeks, you find out he's you know going to land on Robodot Island of some kind, and he's not going to return. That's a different situation. That's a different story. Then Matt Murray's money does become available because you're not expecting to have to put that 4.6 million back into your cap structure. And that becomes something that you could use. Uh, but in terms of Muzzins, that's, that's, that money's kind of been long spent and um, which is why, you know, a lot of people who, uh, you know, do the cap. Well, like a lot of capologists, I suppose kind of looked and, and when that O'Reilly trade came through, especially it's like, okay, that signals for sure that Jake Muzzin's not coming because that's where a lot of that money kind of was was used also, along with the fact that they have a full 23-man roster as opposed to, you know, the 20-man roster that we were talking about earlier in the season. Um, it's not 23 guys anymore, though, Dave. There was a roster move that was made for the Maple Leafs, and I wonder if this does – kind of signal that there is another trade in the works of some kind. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But first, let me tell you about one of the show sponsors. And it's FanDuel. It is the midway point to the NHL season. Uh, and now's the perfect time to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers getting no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And you can bet on everything from money line to point scores, goal scores, even shot props. They got it all at uh, FanDuel+. Plus. It even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. If you think that both Matthews, Nylander, and... Uh, John Tavares is going to score in a game. You can parlay all those, and if you win, you win big. And they pay out pretty much as soon as the game's over as well. So you get uh, a quick and easy payout from FanDuel. So don't miss the chance to get our no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the Locked On Network. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. Um, so we were just talking about how there was one update that was made to the roster. Jake Muzzin, for sure, will not be returning at all in the regular season, also the playoffs. So it's not a Kucherov thing either where they're going to you know, have him sitting and then return for a playoffs at some point. Just not going to happen. And... Because of that, Dave, before we get to the next roster move that we saw happen, I am curious if you believe the team, as it's situated now with these six guys, do you feel comfortable with this blue line? Or do you think that there is some sort of upgrade or trade that needs to be made between today and next Friday's NHL trade deadline? I, It's hard for me, just seeing how it's played the last few months, it's hard for me to get behind this blue line as it sits currently just because it's like Jordy Ben, we haven't seen play in forever. So like his spot in that, in the, on the roster right now, I'm like a little, I'm questioning it a little bit. Like they're not playing him at all. Like what's he really doing there? Yeah. But he's your eight. Like he's right. let's, let's focus on like the six, yeah. seven guys who are playing. But the reason why I say that is okay. They they waived Joey Anderson, like Jordy Ben just sticking around for no reason. This is how I brought up. But as the six currently sit right now, it really depends on is it Timminson or is it it's it's probably well it is Sandine that's part of the six. Timmins is on the seventh. Yeah. Right there. I I'm still not comfortable because Justin Hall, I just don't feel like he can play in the playoffs against top caliber teams. Like, yeah, I, I think he can play, just I don't think he's a top four guy. I well, think if, if you get an upgrade in your top four and then he's all of a sudden 
now playing bottom pair sheltered third minutes with Sandine or with Giordano, all of a sudden I do feel more comfortable with what Justin Hall as a defenseman on this team. I just don't want him going up against, you know, top six opposition of Boston and Tampa or top line opposition as the main shutdown pair that I just don't, I don't like the the thought of that. No. And the reason why I'm not comfortable with that is because as the top six currently sits, we just found out when Rasmus Sandin goes down, Justin Hall is getting bumped up to play with Morgan Riley. That cannot happen anymore. I'm sorry. I do not want to see that ever again. Shoot that pairing into the moon. They've been awful the last couple of games. Yeah. Like that, that to me, this is why the whole Jake, like I understand some are saying, you know, now there's clarity on Jake Muzzin, but now it's like you don't have Jake Muzzin. Mm-hmm. He's the guy that you're trying. Like we've been saying it for a while. He's the guy you're trying to replace. It's not easy to replace him because I don't know if people have been looking out on the trade market. It's a bare wasteland for defensemen that bring the style. Now everyone's bringing up Luke Shen's name. I understand that, but he's one guy. He's also not Jake Muzzin. He's not Jake Muzzin either. That's like exactly he brings one. bite. But Jake Muzzin brings a lot more than that. Like, Jake Muzzin's a smart player, and he's a guy who also, like, he was a player who, too, had a really good, like, first pass. So when they killed plays and shut things down defensively, he was able to spring, you know, Marner or Matthews or Nylander or Tavares, whoever it was, Engvall, spring those guys to kind of create offense on the counterattack. Justin Hall doesn't really do that. (laughs) <laughs> right like geo can do that geo geo's pretty good when it comes to to springing some offense um but like luke shen's not going to do that for you you know what i mean so it's not like a pure a pure uh you know like you're bringing in a guy who's got a little bit of brutes to him meat and potatoes which is what we want but it's not an exact replica of what jake muzzin brings and what this team needs yeah, see, like, I think that, like, I'm seeing, I see it in the comments all the time. Uh, they need more guys, you know, who are going to, like, cross check a guy or, you know, play with a little more oomph to their game. That's fine and dandy. You can get guys that can be physical. But do you know what's even more important? When you're going up against the Tampa and the Boston, being able to get the puck out of your own zone, right? Being able to keep yourself from being hemmed into your own zone for extended periods of time. And Jake Muzzin didn't wasn't really a guy that would get caught in those situations all the time. Justin Hall certainly does because we've seen him fail to clear the puck on numerous times. And Justin Hall isn't the most physical guy either. That's the other issue. I like I'm like I I saw him in person. Like he's he laid a couple of hits, but he's not the that's not his first instinct. His first instinct is not really go and hit the guy or try to separate with his body it's more so trying to do with the stick you need to find guys that can do the you know other things and let's not it's also when it comes to luke shen vancouver canucks i understand he's playing top four minutes it's more so because he is one of their better options which doesn't speak very highly of the vancouver canucks defense right now and when he was with tampa he was the seventh guy so he was not even the top in their top six consideration. Yeah, like I, I don't necessarily think that Luke Shen is an upgrade on Timothy Lilligren. I don't even know if he's an upgrade on Justin Hall. Is he a different player? Will he bring different aspects? Therefore, he would be more complementary to this blue line. Perhaps he brings a little bit more, you know, uh, you know, a little bit more edge to his game. However. I still think uh, I, I just I'm not sold that that's it. I think this team, if they're going to bring in the defenseman, it's not another depth piece. If they're going to bring anybody in, it's got to be someone who can play up your lineup and is a top four guy, not masks as a top four guy. They have players who do that now. Yeah. Like I don't think you get another haul. You don't go, go and get another um, Jordy Ben. You, like the, you need to go and get yourself like a a, a guy who can play in your top four. Uh, Dimitri Orlov is a name that's been brought up uh, who might be on the block. You know, he can eat minutes in your top four. How about a guy like Connor Murphy out in uh, out in Chicago, Jake McCabe out in Chicago? Like, those guys can play heavy top four minutes, and they're they're hard to play against, and they're big bodies. 
and they can do a little bit more. And, you know, I trust them to play 20 plus minutes a game and be effective more than I would, you know, a Hall or a Lu Chen. Lilligren's quickly getting getting up there where it comes to, you know, comfort level playing in top four minutes. But I don't know if I if, if he'll do that in the playoffs. I would rather be a little bit more sure of myself going into the postseason and get a guy who I know can do it as opposed to just hoping that Lilligren or Justin Hall will figure it out by then, um, knowing that they haven't really had much success in the postseason. So that's kind of where I sit on that. I, even going into it before the O'Reilly trade, I even said I think that defense is more of a priority. I think it was great, the O'Reilly trade, bringing him in and Old Chari. I think they're completely set up front. But can they bring in someone on the back end um, who can play not just play in your top four, but is a top four? And maybe somebody who you can pair with, uh, that you could pair with Morgan Riley, potentially. Or you could pair with Mark Giordano um, as a you know, shutdown defender who can play 22 minutes a night, maybe 20, 22 minutes a night. So that's kind of where I'm at when it comes to to the Leafs blue line. Like, I, I think it's possible. Don't get me wrong. It's not like if they don't make a move, I don't believe this team can make it out of the first round. It's not a must, but I would feel way better about this group. Um, and that blue line. If, uh, if, if they did make a move to address and beef up that top four. See, like, I think Timothy Lohgren is perfectly fine as like the number four guy. If he's the second pairing guy, I can live with that. Cause I've seen a lot of him. As you mentioned, he's taken all strides in his game but if you're asking me am i okay if timothy looker all of a sudden gets moved out to the top pairing not not particularly like if it's for one game like you know teams have to do that for one game but for a whole playoff series i don't think i am and that's 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 why tj brody is probably the best suited basically on this current line roster right now it's just that if you can move Timothy Lilligren to that third pairing with like a Ras with Rasmus Sandin and them to make up the third pairing, and then you get someone to play with Giordano on that second pairing. Yeah, and Hall's your Hall's your seven, and then Timmons is your eight, and and Ben's your nine. Hallelujah! Or you use Hall's cap space, which you might have to do to make you know to make a deal to to do that perhaps. Um, now all of a sudden you, you're kind of liking, liking what's going on a bit more. It's just depth, right? It's the same situation when you bring in O'Reilly that just slotted guys more to proper situations. If you bring in the top four guy, that's going to slot, you know, Lilligren, Sandine Hall into more proper situations. And that's how they're going to flourish. That's, that's ultimately, I think what, uh, what needs to be done. And if you're Kyle Dubas, I'm going to use this analogy. Remember the Blue Jays? They went out a couple of weeks before the trade deadline. They landed who? Who's the Whitman? Troy Tulowitzki. Oh, I was I'm trying to remember which trade deadline you're talking about. So Troy Tul yeah, you're right. I guess I didn't. The, the 2015 trade deadline. I suppose I didn't necessarily give them a one. They landed Troy Tulowitzki. A couple of weeks later, on deadline day, who did they acquire? Got them. Double down. That's right. Picked up my. my I kind of think you could do this where you picked up Ryan O'Reilly and that was your Troy Tulowitzki. Now go get your top four defenseman and make that the David Price and just go all in. This is your year. Get it done. Mm -hmm. Question now becomes they gave up the uh, quite a bit of their draft capital this year. What's it going to take now to get that top four guy? Uh, it depends who you're looking to get. But if it, it's, I mean, you have next year's first round pick, you could deal. You've got Topi Nimala, you've got Nick Robertson. If it's the right piece, Matthew Nice could be made available. I don't think he's again. I've I've very much been on the uh, train where I'm not trading Nice for a rental. Yeah. He's got to be a good young defenseman in in his prime in order to make that move. But if it's available out there, yeah, I think you certainly could make. Uh, you know, make a concession there to really strengthen that blue line. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're good up front and you know that you've got your blue line situated. You, you're you not going to be able to get your goaltending in order. Like they, Samson obviously your ride or die no matter what, but at least you can equip him with a really good defense 
a solid 12-man unit who will support the defense and make them even better. And then hopefully you just get the timely save and then he can go mano a mano against, you know, Andre Vasilevsky or Linus Allmark. Sam Sal's not better than those guys. Like that's that's not what I'm saying. And he never will be better than those guys. Like those, like the there we're talking about the goalie of our generation right now in Vasilevsky and the guy who's most likely gonna win goaltender of the year um in Linus Allmark. Like that's he, he Samsonov's not gonna be those guys. Can he outdo him in a seven game series if his team in front of him plays really well? That I think he could do. So I'll- because I saw in our com, I saw someone point in the comments. Oh well, the Le- you know the Leafs don't have a Vasilevsky, and that, that's why they're going to lose. Well, the Leafs also took Tampa to seven games, and they didn't have a Vasilevsky in that. So, but and I guess who also didn't have a Vasilevsky in that? The Colorado Avalanche. True, there, that's another good one. Is um, uh, Darcy, Kemper? Darcy Kemper like any better than Ilya Samsonov? Not, not, not right now. And now, how he played last season? No. Nope. Freddie Frances, Freddie Francois, whatever the hell his name is, Pavel Francois. Is he is he any better than 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 Ilya Samsonov? I don't think so. Like personally, I think Samsonov, and even look, I would even take a Matt Murray over Pavel Francois at this point. Well, okay, let's not get crazy now. <laughs> let's not get crazy here, Dave. Come on now. You're gonna lose in credibility with that one. Come on, no, I was playing. I get what you're saying, but uh, no, like my point is, is if 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 the team is well built around you, you know, you can you can help a goaltender look better than he is. And uh, if you don't allow much, you don't allow anything, you can make him look like a stud. Mm-hmm. And Toronto's been able to do that actually the last couple of years in the playoffs. Like goaltending hasn't been the problem. For them, it's scoring goals, and you had a guy like Ryan O'Reilly, like that could put this team over the top. Like that's the type of move that puts them over the top. This is a guy who scored five goals in a Stanley Cup final en route to a Conn Smythe victory. He knows how to play in these games. He knows how to wake up for these moments and get his team bought in to get over that hump, right? So, you know, I feel good about things, but I'd feel a lot better if they were able to really shore up the blue line. And I think this is the year you go all in to do it. Empty the cupboard, man. Empty the cupboard. That's my message to Kyle Dubas. Empty the cupboard. Go full Alex Anthopoulos. Who cares? Because you win a championship, right? Yeah. That parade will be a lot better than those picks and prospects. I could tell you that. I'm not looking forward to the 2020. Like, I'm not like waiting and seeing what the 2024 draft has to offer the least because they're not going to be in the top 10. Likely not. Not with this roster currently constructed. No, exactly. So we'll see. Uh, All right, we'll take one more quick break, actually, and uh, I'll tell you about the roster move that the Maple Leafs did make today. Um, So we'll tell you about that in just a moment. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Moore Studio. Listen to Locked On Leafs Podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. It's Mike DiStefano and Dave Morissuti. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs did make a roster move today. Um, there was the update on Jake Muzzin that he will not return for the rest of this season and playoffs, and then he will get uh, reevaluated in September and see if he can continue his career next season. But he, is, he has been shut down for the remainder of this year. Um but there was a roster move that was made today, one that kind of had me kind of scratching my head a little bit. And then I sort of think about it, and, and I think I can make a little bit of sense of it. Um, Joey Anderson was put on waivers today. Um, I don't like, did that surprise you to see that he was placed on waivers at all? Like, what did you make of that? Did you make anything of that move? Like, for me, I'm sitting here thinking they didn't need to do that. It's not like they needed the raw, the – um, roster spot. It's not like somebody was coming up. It just, they sent him down and w- what happens next? Yeah. I mean, you look, I mean, we, we just looked at the team's cap situation. Like they're not looking to create cap space for someone to come back or from like injured reserve or anything like that. I just wonder if one of two things, I know that they're going to be going on a road trip. So are they preparing to bring somebody up and they didn't want to bring, you no, know, 
looking if you're looking at the forwards, yeah, Joey Anderson's the obvious guy to go down. And I guess they want to maintain the depth they have with their uh, blue line right now, so they don't want to send down one of. I mean, the only guy they would send down is Jordy Ben. So yeah, it was it wasn't surprising to see that Joey Anderson was the guy that was waived because it's just he's the only guy that you would take off the roster right now. Yeah, I think the uh, I think the question here is, well, I guess it depends if he gets if he gets sneaks through or not. I'm not sure he does. I think there could be a team out there like a Chicago or you know Arizona or any team really. It was one of those bottom feeder teams that could take a flyer on him and say, you know, you know, there's been some some decent hockey play out of him lately. Let's see what he could do, right? Just a, a young player, 24 years old. Let's see. So he could get claimed, which would be unfortunate because I think that he's a, a good depth piece. But the other thing that I thought of was typically we see moves like this happen around the deadline because teams want to see if a, a, a club can get that team through, get that player through waivers. And then when you trade for that player, all of a sudden – that guy can go up and down and not have to go through waivers again. So that makes him a little bit more attractive as a trade asset. So there's also that, which means they clearly are still working the phones if that would be the case. And he could be one of the guys, you know, a younger player who could get dealt, um, you know, along with, uh, along with, you know, some picks or prospects or, uh, you know, maybe another roster player potentially, that was kind of the the other thing that I thought of because it, it, other than that, it really didn't make sense to send him down. No, and like you're not craving to find a roster spot in terms of contract, right? right? They do have only they do only have they have 49 right now. So if he does, let's say get claim, it kind of gives you a little bit of breathing room there. But you also would wouldn't want to lose Joey Anderson for nothing. But I mean, I don't yeah. think the team's gonna come out and say, yeah, we'll give you a fourth or fifth round pick for Joey Anderson. I don't know if that's a reality right now, but yeah, it's just allowing that, that flexibility. Cause I think, you know, there are quite a few guys with the Marlies right now. I mean, other than Simmons, I think Simmons doesn't require waivers anymore. Like, no, cause he, he cleared last week. Right. So he can kind of come up and down as they choose. I mean, he's not with the Marlies, right. He's technically like, He's waved him, but he's just hanging around. Like he's not reporting to to the Marlies. I think uh, Bobby McMahon can come up and down as as often as he pleases. Pontus Holmberg can come up and down. So uh, he's really the only one who did require waivers out of those, you know, those guys who had been called up this year. And I think that's also why it took him a while to get the call up because they knew once they bring him back up, then he would require waivers pretty much to to go back down. Um, yeah, we'll see if he ends up getting picked up. You know, there was a, a a time not too long ago where any player that hit the waiver wire would get uh, get picked up by by a team. So we'll see. We'll see what happens with Joey Anderson. I'll also say this: teams are cognizant of whether they'll make in the claim because they add a contract to their contract limit. Some teams want to have a little bit of that flexibility heading into the deadline. You know, Chicago just made. A nothing trade for well, not nothing in terms of they gave up nothing for Nikita Zaitsev, but they gained a second round pick. They may want the ability to take on more contracts like that. So if they claim a Joey Anderson, that's one less contract that they can add to their books. Yeah, right? that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, if you did miss that trade, uh, the Senators opened up some cap space today by trading away Maple Leafs legend Nikita Zaitsev uh, to Chicago. And they gave them a second and a fourth round pick to take that deal on because he still has a cap hit of four and a half million next year as well. And it's actually four and a half million in, in like real dollars, actual cash. So um, it's going to cost them, you know, more than it did to broker like the Ryan O'Reilly deal, obviously, because there's more money going into next year as well. So it cost them a second round pick to get that done. Um, so that was one trade that we saw happen, which which also probably signals that Ottawa could be close to making a deal here, and they just needed to move out some salary in order to 
to facilitate that trade and, and get the sign off on that. So that is something to keep an eye on for sure. Ottawa, who's been in on seemingly every single defenseman um, <laughs> that gets brought up in, in, uh, in, in the trade market. So we'll see if Ottawa finally lands that defenseman after looking and looking and looking for two seasons, I believe it's been now. So that's something to keep an eye on. And um, the other thing to keep an eye on also Vegas traded out uh, some, some space kind of uh, Shea Weber got dealt Shea Weber going from Vegas to Arizona uh, along with a fifth round pick for Dyson Mayo, a depth defenseman coming back to, uh, to the Vegas golden Knights. So that's another trade that went down today. But did you see the uh, this new report coming out of the New York Post? I think Emily Kaplan was kind of first reporting it actually at VSBN. The Rangers might double back, circle back on Patty Kane. You seeing this? I did see this. Um, they ha- would have to have salary go the other way because even if Chicago retained and another team retains, it still would not be enough. Right. Let me paint a picture for you. Okay. Look at the team that they are right now, right? They're, they're they, brought in, they brought in Tarasenko, and they're sitting here thinking there was an article written by our favorite journalist, Steve Simmons, in the Toronto Sun not too long ago that when they made that trade saying, this is your new contender, cup contender out of the East. And and look, I actually agree with that take. That is a deep team up front when they acquired Tarasenko, made him even deeper. Uh, they have a great blue line, Truba, Lindgren, Adam Fox, Keandre Miller, Braden Schneider. Like, that is a good, good blue line. They added uh, Stan Mikula as well. And then, obviously, Igor Shosturkin in, in between the, the pipes there. So, like, that's a great hockey team. If you go and you double down in the same way that I want Kyle Dubas to do, if, if Chris Drury does the same thing and he goes and he gets himself Patrick Kane and you say, okay, we got to move out a little bit of salary here. Capo Caco has not been the player that they expected him to be when he was selected second overall. He's making, I believe, $2.1 million, I want to say, this year and next as an RFA. I believe if you move out Capo Caco's money, you can make this deal work. They also could be looking to move out Kratzov. Kratzov is that Vitaly Kratzov? Kratzov? But he's making, like, I think he's still in his ELC, so that's that's not going to – no. it's not enough. But, yes, he could be part of the deal as well, I suppose. Yeah, so, yeah, because I'm looking here. There aren't, like, players I'm looking at. And the weird thing is they acquired Tyler Mott, who comes out of $1.35 million cap it. Like, for a Rangers team that would, like, that 1.3 probably would have helped them get a little bit more breathing room to make a deal for a Patrick Kane. Um, so yeah, it's very curious. It's, it's, I mean, the, we heard what Patrick Kane said about the Rangers, that that was a team he flat out said that was a team he had considered. Yeah. Well, don't, don't close the door just yet. I think, uh, the Rangers, the way they responded from the Tarasenko trade, I think has allowed management to say, okay, let's see if we can just, you know, continue to add because. They certainly can. They have picks still to trade out. You know, if they are smart about it, they don't. They have a lot of prospects. Rangers are in a good spot right now. That's for sure. Yeah, I think they're like twenty-two, five and three, or something like that. In their last thirty games, like, yeah, they're in a really, really good spot. The uh, the New York Rangers are. All right, pal. Let's uh, let's wrap her up here. It was a fun show. Good stuff. Um, we'll come back tomorrow and, uh, we'll tee up the game against the Minnesota wild. So they got the wild back in town before they head out West on the road trip through Western Canada, which I think actually starts in Seattle. So now I guess Seattle's included in the Western Canada road trip, which ruins the, you know, what, what, what we call it, but say lovey, they got, uh, they got the wild tomorrow first anyway. So we're not going to look past Minnesota. 
But, uh, yeah, that'll do it for us here today on the podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked On Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Morissuti. Follow the show as well at Locked On Leafs. Go ahead, leave a like and a comment down below. Click the little notification bell so you know when we put out new content, which we do each and every day, Monday through Friday. Um, we'll be back with another episode tomorrow, folks. Leafs and Wild will tee it up for you. But until then, keep it locked right here on Lockdown Leafs.